everybody. Welcome to Radio Dead Air Tech Q&A. You've got questions, we've got guesses. Um, we're here to answer your tech questions and have a look at the uh, the news in tech for the past couple weeks. Uh, I'm Nash, I do Radio Dead Air. I've got well over a decade's worth of tech experience along with me is my producer, Mike Gearman. Same Boom. sort of resume going on there. And oh my God, this week. Yeah. The only way it's going to be more of a shit show is if Verizon ver uh, merged with AT&T. Oh, uh, the next four We're years. The next four years, man. Uh, at, at least two, you know, they could take the uh, one of the houses back in, in, in the midterms. <laughs> the next There's a years. possibility, okay? Let me have that dream that's only going to be uh, two years of shit, followed by two years of less shit. Hmm. So, yeah, obviously. Obviously, neither Nash nor I are Trump supporters. Yeah. Because we have both thumbs and functioning brain stems. Yeah. You, you might edit that out. I don't know. I don't give a fuck. Look at all the fucks I get. Yeah. I am completely fuckless. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the Trump White House is soon to be upon us. The Trump administration... And this is going to have impact on a lot of different things. A lot of different segments of our oh, yeah. society. A lot of people are concerned. And since this is a tech show, there is some stuff we need to be concerned about on Absolutely. the internet side of things. The primary one, the first one, the one that stands out and is glaring, the one that Trump has already called, um, what was it, Obamacare for the internet? Yeah, that was that was the phrase net yep. neutrality. Now, he has backed up and said he's not going to get rid of all of Obamacare, but or the ACA rather, giving it giving it official name. Uh, but he hasn't said anything about net neutrality since taking the election. Yeah. Um, so he's got a lot of ways he can get rid of net neutrality or attack it and make it go away to the to the uh, betterment of the pocketbooks of the investors of well, let's, the Verizon. Let's the back up a little bit, because even in 2016, sure. not everybody understands what net neutrality okay. means. Good point. Uh, this is one of those things that people have heard the phrase and they tune out the rest. Net neutrality. And they think, hmm? and they think it they think, they, they, or they just think it means something other than what it means. Yeah. They think it it means, you know. Oh, that's a horrible thing. It's a bad thing. Well, no, it's not really, as we'll explain. Net neutrality is a principle that says internet, you cannot discriminate against certain type of traffic on the internet, and you cannot charge different prices for different types of traffic. Uh, it means that with your internet connection, you receive Netflix, Google, Ars Technica, CNN. Um, CNN, you receive all of these across your internet connection at the same speed with no roadblocks, no impediments, nobody saying, nobody differentiating how traffic reaches you yeah. or how your traffic reaches the internet. Exactly. Now, there may be speed differences you notice, but that could be on their end rather than your right. CNN, probably a little bit higher traffic than Ars Technica. Right. It's, there should be no roadblocks with your internet service provider. provider. That means when you send a request to Netflix for a movie, it should reach your computer at the, the fastest possible speed that Netflix can send that compute that information to your computer. Now, what net neutral? Why net neutrality is an important reason to it, it's an important policy to imp, have in place is that without it. Comcast, who, by the way, owns their own entertainment. They're not just an internet service provider. They also pr are a content provider. Yeah. Without net neutrality, Comcast could decide, well, we have our own video streaming, and we'll send that to you for at the same speed it needs to reach you with no problems. But if you want Netflix, we're going to put a toll on that one. Okay, if you want to get Netflix, you're going to have to pay a little bit extra because or they have to pay a little bit extra or some or or it's just not going to come through as fast. Right. No toll necessary. We're just not going to make it as fast. 
or they might or net neutrality says they can decide we're not going to facilitate this yeah, it, without net neutrality they can say we don't want to let you get netflix anymore yeah now the the analogy for this is of course roads hmm. generally speaking anyone who has a car can use the roads and you don't get you don't pay a different amount yeah you might pay a different amount of your car taxes things like that but you don't pay a different amount to use the roads everyone can use the roads at the same speed or in the case of greater los angeles at the same stall uh and net neutrality as it's written does have certain set asides and things like that which are analogous to say a carpool lane mm. you know but by and large your general internet traffic flows their speed so we have a situation now where the the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, had been going towards net neutrality because and the oh, heavily, going towards, heavily, yeah. And the reason they've been going towards net neutrality is because the FCC is made up of five people. Mm -hmm. There are two Democrats, two Republicans is how it's divided, and whatever party the president belongs to gets the fifth. And, and when when one of them has a term expire, when they expire, they stay in office until their replacement is approved by Congress. So one of them actually expired in 2015, and she's still on there because Congress hasn't approved her replacement because mm -hmm. they don't want to. Yep. So what's likely to happen with her or Wheeler, who's the one that uh, President Obama appointed, uh, is... One or both of them may step down. Well, her term is, uh, I forget her name, but she's in here somewhere, in the article somewhere. Her term has expired. Uh, she's may or may not get renewed by Congress. Uh, Wheeler's set, talking about stepping down. So that's two down. He has to refill, they have to refill one as a Democrat, and then he gets to pick one. And that new Republican-controlled FCC could say, yeah, we don't like net neutrality as much yeah. and change the rules. We're getting in the weeds a little bit. Sure, sure. the reason everyone is thinking, I thought net neutrality was settled. I thought it was the law now. I thought there had been a Supreme Court case. No. Net neutrality is not a law. Uh, nothing the FCC decides on is a law. It's a rule. They're a governing body, and those rules get updated and changed. There could be a net neutrality law, but there isn't one. That's why everything has fallen to the FCC. And with a Republican-led Senate, House, and presidency, we're not likely to see a net neutrality law right. anytime soon. The reason why net neutrality was able to be implemented in the first place is because the FCC, as it stands now, reclassified internet service providers under Title II, which is part of, they, they were in, empowered to reclassify them as common providers. Uh, what, what was it? it's the same way utilities. So, now, yeah, you t your, your electric, water, whatever, uh, your, your common utilities. So whoever wired your town. Right. They may have other electricity providers they didn't necessarily like when they started, when they wired the town. Mm -hmm. But if they ha are hooked up properly, they can sell you electricity. So in a, in a given town, you might have multiple electricity providers. You pay whichever one you want and you get your electricity because the, the wires are common. Now, in, in this instance, the reason why it went to the Supreme Court was because they determined that in order to do this, the FCC had to do the Title II reclassification. However, they did it in such a way as they are allowed to only implement what parts of common utility rules they see fit to implement. They haven't said the same rules for electricity providers apply to internet service providers. They've said that we're applying this and this, we're reserving the right to do this, we're not doing this at all. This is a slipshot approach, uh, a slapdash approach. This is, is sort of cobbled together. It's legal and it's what the FCC had at their disposal to implement net neutrality. What a Republican-controlled FCC, and make no uh, mistake, mistake, uh, Ajit Pai, I believe, that's how we say his name. I'm not entirely sure. It's it's P-A-I. Um, yeah. 
I say PAI like Psy, like the the weapon, but I might be wrong there. He has been, he's most likely to move up to commissioner of the FCC. And he has been mind-bendingly, logic-twisting in his opposition to net neutrality. He will say things that make absolutely no rational, logical sense in order to justify that net neutrality is a bad thing. Yes. Think of him as the bizarro world uh, FCC commissioner. Yes. Him no like net neutrality. So it's, it's quite possible that this could be struck down. And if it is... <sighs> You could be looking at paying more for your internet to access parts of the internet. Uh, you could be looking to not be able to access parts of the internet at all. Um, and it's it's going to make it harder for people who want to reach you to reach you. Content you might like and rely on could end up costing you more. It is not unreasonable, especially considering they have a very antagonistic stance with, what with Google Fiber and Comcast and the fight. It's yeah. not unreasonable that without net neutrality, Comcast could start charging extra for, for YouTube. Yeah. I think what Google needs to do in that case is, like, I don't know, buy ABC. Mm. Buy their own content brand and start going to, yeah, if you do that to us, we'll do it to you. And suddenly it'll be, you know, uh, Cold War situation in there, and there'll be uh, mutually assured destruction, but I think Google will win that one. The other issues there are to consider... What the fuck are you doing? Knock it off. Knock it off. <laughs> the other issues to consider are things like uh, data caps, which the FCC has been keeping a leery eye on, and those might start becoming more common. Yeah, and Ajit uh, Pai has no problem with those either. Nope. Uh, throttling. That, I don't remember if he liked throttling or not, but I would suspect that he was okay with it. Yeah, it's it's a lot of these policies that had been, without you even knowing it, a lot of the FCC policies that had been benefiting you and helping you and making your life surprisingly keeping costs down as much as was within their power, these policies are all in danger and quite likely to be dismissed. Uh, another one that was a, we were trying to implement was set top box reform was the the, yeah. the idea that uh, you were you you could get a set top box of your own other companies could make them that you wouldn't have to be beholden to a cable company to rent this obsolete power sucking awful interface device just to watch cable TV. You, there would be Roku could make their own set top box or Apple could make a set top box or Google could and you could buy it from them and it could have apps and it could have features and it made things a lot easier. Yeah, and the Apple box used three-year-old technology and five-year-old parts. <laughs> but now that, that it looks like the reform set top box reform is pretty much dead in the water. And yeah. Th this is this is uh, until until unless a congressman gets really pissed off at. Did you see that? <laughs> I saw him. I saw him bounce off the off wall. The wall. Yeah. I'm not really sure what he was doing. And then you 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 lean back and he's like, "What me? No, nothing." Goofy little shit. I think your cat has a case of the crazies right now. He always has the case of the crazies. Uh, so it's. There's a lot yeah. to watch out for, and it's it's very frustrating for a lot of yes. us. Um, the upside is when things like this happen, and this is not to reassure you that everything's going to be fine, because I can't tell you everything's going to be fine, but the upside is when things like this happen, technology companies tend to come up with ways to work around these things. Uh, an example would be um, the very fact that there's going to be no set top box reform is an impetus for people to say, well, I don't want to deal with this shit anyway. And there are alternatives now. There are Roku's, there are uh, Chromecast, there are Apple TVs. Yep. There are devices that are not connected to cable. Not yeah, to the I TV this, side of things. I think this was the cable company shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. Try, yeah. trying to 
maintain control. Yeah, because... And it's, it's like, well, it's like from Star Wars A New Hope. The more tightly they grasp, the more, more uh, customers will slip through their fingers. The, the set top, the, the little device, TV device manufacturers have an, uh, an incentive now to make their devices more user friendly, more attractive to customers, to be cheaper than even getting cable in the first place. Um, yeah. I don't own a Roku. I was visiting my girlfriend. She's got a Roku. And I noticed that um, I could very simply watch tons and tons of stuff on her TV while she was at work uh, through her Roku without cable. And I didn't even notice I wasn't using a cable box. Uh, I, I had access to stuff like the CW. I had access to stuff, recent episodes of their shows. Um, ABC, I didn't. ABC required you to have a cable service provider. I think that's going to change pretty soon. Um, and these, I'm not talking about stuff like Hulu and Netflix. I'm talking like the CW. I'm talking like uh, other network, other network television channels. Sure, there were ads on it, but just it was just like watching television. Yeah, it's, I'm going to put up with commercials occasionally for selling selling laundry detergent. Who the hell cares? Yeah. Maybe I'll learn about some new technology in laundry detergent. Uh, probably not, but... And when you see people with a $20 Roku stick can get about the same parity with cable television yeah. without having to spend $80 a month yep. and just paying $25 up front for a Roku stick, I think, yeah, you're right. Cable, uh, cable has shot themselves in the foot with this, and... So, so anyway, there are going to be a lot of internet related because of the FCC, because Congress has not passed any laws about it in at least six years, um, because we're probably going to see any laws that do get passed be more in line with deregulation. Um, you, you're going to things are going to change and not necessarily for the better. So yeah. brace yourselves, guys. I hate saying that, but. It's it's not looking good. <sighs> so let's look into more other stuff that's going on, because surprisingly enough, there was other stuff this week. Let's look at the first one. Um, let's look at what Google. Another issue online, a big one for everybody, is online advertising, um, which has been a bit ad blocking has been something controversial over this year. Uh, especially when ad blocking was made available for oh, iOS and media said, oh, no, this is the death of the media because we can't get ads no more. And all of them focused on this argument that everyone wants content for free without focusing on another aspect of ads that is equally important. The fact that some ads can be dangerous and I'm not talking about content. I'm talking about ads that allow this Google AdSense. Um, and this, I want to point out, this was not on the operating system. This was on Google's side. This is on their back end. This is on their ad delivery system. AdSense uh, was sending out advertisements that included um, trojanbanker.androidos.svpeng. Uh, Trojan malware. Okay, so it basically, to give a quick version, there's there's multiple types of malware out there in the world. Mm -hmm. There's viruses. Everyone knows viruses spreads to different computers and does stupid shit to your computer, deleting stuff, possibly encrypting stuff. There's worms, which, hey, again, spread from computer to computer, slowing things down. Mm -hmm. Generally, not as destructive as viruses, but they can be much more annoying in many visible ways. Mm -hmm. And Trojan horses. Well, if you all remember the story of the Trojan horse, it's something that you've let into your computer that is now going to do something bad. In this yes. case, it steals your banking information. Now, some people go, well, I don't bank on my phone. That's okay. You might have other credentials it's stealing, which it then uses to get your banking information. Yep, and that's what happened here. And um, 300,000 uh, Android handsets, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's only because this was, I, I guess you consider a limited release. 300,000 Google handsets, Android handsets, were infected with a Trojan virus 
that was skimming people's banking information and they didn't have to download anything. How it worked was they visited a web page, they looked at an ad, and due to this uh, compromise of Google's AdSense, by looking at the ad, it silently downloaded the Trojan yeah. now, in the background. This one, did, this one did have to be installed to activate, but there are plenty of people, given the fact they had it on 300,000 machines, mm -hmm. uh, 300,000 phones, that would go, oh, this thing says it needs to update my whatever. Yes, because people click things without knowing what they are. All right, now, first off, Gelly says, I don't do banking on my phone. That doesn't matter. Um, do you have a Google account? Do you have an account that synchronizes your desktop web page, web surfing uh, with your phone? Because if that ha that information goes across the cloud between those two devices, it can look at your browsing history from your phone. It can look at your desktop browsing history because those are synchronized. And once it's there, it's in. It can see all your, if you've ever typed in your credit card to order a pizza, it can see that. Yeah. And it's got now, your credit card. Fortunately, for probably 99% of the listeners to this show, this one was limited to smartphones with a Russian language interface. So... That's why I said Unless, limited rollout. Yeah, limited rollout. But that just means they were possibly either not worried about trying to get it to work, to work in the U.S. or they're testing it to make sure the delivery method worked and Google caught them before they could roll it out to, to, to the English mm. uh, language. Now, in any case, it worked. They got 300,000 devices. Mm -hmm. They're going to continue to try. So it's good that Google caught them and has I guarantee you they're bulking up ways to prevent this from happening again. But it, it's a, it, it is a, a, uh, a war effort here. Anytime Google co goes, we've got these new ways to block these things, the bad guys find uh, new ways to get them out. Now, the ad model is not inherently a bad thing. Ads pay no. for services. They've done this for, for years. They've paid for television for years. they paid for newspapers for years. The only trouble here is with the digital ads. It gives them access to your computer. And I feel a lot of companies don't take this quite as seriously as yeah. they should. Because if you're watching an ad on your television, it's not going to be able to change the channel. God, I hope not. Yeah. G give it time, though, with smart TVs. There'll be one that'll go, you should be watching reruns of How I Met Your Mother. No, you should be watching titties. Titties, titties, titties. We're gonna do you have porn? We're gonna watch porn. That's what we're watching now. Because I mean, it's, it's ads. But um the rise of blocking ads is not just people, I want things for free. It's I want to protect myself from shit that you're not taking care of. Yeah. Now and the now the difference between TV ads, of course, and, and computer ads is TV ad is basically display only. Newspaper mm -hmm. ad, display only. It can't right. make you do anything. With a computer ad, it has to put information on your computer to display the, the ad. And ideally, the ad should be sandboxed and shouldn't be able to access anything at all no. outside the little bit of memory it needs to display the ad and whatever functionality is you know, to show the, the graphical part of the ad. It should be very, very limited. And it's not as limited as it should be Probably because it's stupidly hard to make it that limited. Yeah, and it, it it's we're, these are it, it, like with the Internet of Things and the DDoS attacks and with stuff like this now. There's no impetus on companies to put in the effort to secure these things. Yeah, not until they're forced to. Yeah, and 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 part of this is because. You know, with the Internet of Things, with these ads, it's because the people who possibly, quite possibly, people who came up with these ideas initially, just didn't consider people would use them in a malicious manner. Well, no, I, I there, there's a difference there. The engineers who come up with these things do consider these things. They are often overruled by marketing departments who. Want, Say we have to roll this out now. We have to. We need this, but we can't because it's got this. We don't care. We have a deadline, but we can't. But we don't care. 
That's where we are with these things. And that's why, like I was saying with the set-top box thing, uh, ad blocking is a way of technology getting around this nonsense. The, the response to this has been ad blockers to stop those uh, certain sites to, to make a list of sites and servers that can't get through to your computer yeah. to deliver well, in that information. And something amusing about ad blockers, by the way, in regards to this story, hmm. when, when Nash gave me the link to this, I opened it up and it immediately had a pop up that I couldn't get rid of. You know, that said, it looks like you're using an ad blocker. Do you want to turn that off now so you can access the article? And that's the next step is sites are going, it looks like you're using an ad blocker. Now, the way I get around this is uh, Google has their incognito mode, which lets you run still all of your add-ons, but doesn't report back that you're doing things and doesn't save anything locally. So it lets you run ad blocker. As far as I can tell, I don't see any ads. Mm. Um, but doesn't report back saying he's doing this. That's and that's so the, the links all work there. That's going to be it, it's it's a it's a freaking arms race back and forth. Yeah. It's an arms race. That's that's the term <sighs> I was looking for earlier. So that one more thing tonight uh, before we get to questions. Lots of people like using Spotify, but here's another case of we got to get it out and we're not thinking about the consequences. Um. Lots of people use Spotify on their desktop machines or their laptops. And a lot of people have started moving from standard hard drives to uh, SSDs, solid state drives, which are essentially uh, flash memory. They're, they're yeah. great big US, they're great big, really fast USB sticks. Now, the, the main difference between uh, regular hard drives and SSDs, regular hard drive uses magnetic encoding effectively. Uh, you know, you've got platters, you've got mm -hmm. spins. Uh, think of it like a record player aligning magnets, little tiny magnets on there yeah. to encode your data. It, it reads and writes many, many, many thousands of times more right. than an SSD. An SSD, the way it works, can wear out. Yeah, SSDs, flash memory, um, well, like a record. Uh, you know, you etch in, it's like a wax cylinder. You remember wax cylinders for, for audio? Uh, Nash, I don't think any of our audience is old enough okay. to remember wax cylinders. Wax cylinder audio was kind of like a record. It would etch in the the sound into grooves on the wax cylinder. Um, but you couldn't do that repeatedly. You'd wear down. Yeah, and it would wear it wear down on playback, too, because you can't have to have a needle on there to play back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, your wax cylinder would be like, it played great the first time. It plays okay the 50th time. It plays like crap the, the, the 500th time. Physical hard drives, you know, the, the, the magnetic platters have a much more robust read and write rate generally. There's a few brands that are kind of crap, right. but um, then SSDs. SSD, big advantage is they're much, much faster. But over time, they do wear down. Now, a lot of tests have shown they are more robust than they were originally feared. But just more sure. robust does not mean they can understand, they can withstand massive, pro uh, uh, so many reads and writes. And that's a problem yeah. that's popped up with Spotify. Well, let me, let me give another quick example. Uh -huh. uh, if you reformat a hard drive, uh, it's regular hard drive. It's a very straightforward process where it rewrite, it basically writes over everything. And the command you use to do that, you know, whatever your operating system has, is straightforward. If you try to do that with an SSD, you can really screw up the SSD because it's rewriting so many times. Right. So there's a there's special either reformat commands or you just or the SSD manufacturer say just delete it, it's gone. And it's it's become known that the Spotify app um, has for for no discernible reason um, they are it's writing up to let's see. Uh, Leaving the app running over a day resulted in a per drive write of 700 gigabytes. And that's not the data it's downloaded. It's just writing this data. Yeah. Back and forth across the drive, back and forth, back and forth. And we're not entirely sure what it's writing or why it's writing that much data. Now, you, you, you may think that's not a lot of data. Well, yeah, it is. But OK, so if you were streaming music at 10 megabits per second, which is absolutely ridiculous, high definition mm -hmm. audio you would never really listen to no. unless you were 
one of those freaks of nature who goes, I have to listen to this audio at this level. Um, that would still only be, and you did that for an entire day. You'd still only stream 108 gigabytes of data per day. So this is seven times as much writes, reads, well, not even writes, reads and writes, just writes going on uh, yeah, per day. I, 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 I want to I stress, this is not necessarily downloaded data. This is the app itself on your computer reading and writing this data. We don't know what it is. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know why it's reading and writing it so much. I, I really think it's brain manning. It's going, uh, you know, 42, I'm going to write 42. I'm going to write 42. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Okay, four, now 43, 43, 43. And it just, uh, it's right, you know, they, they, Spotify is saying they've already fixed it. Um, uh, they, they, they're saving to, but th the community has been telling them for months. And they're yeah. we're not now again. Well, excuse me. Hold on. They're saying they fixed it in one point zero point four two, which hasn't rolled out to everyone yet. Yeah. And and another thing about this is I, I want to stress again: SSDs are very robust. There's no reason why you shouldn't get one for your computer. It will last you years and years. Um, probably on the same level that a regular standard hard drive would last you. They're not infallible, but they'll last a long time. Now, the disadvantage of SSDs is they're still largely more expensive and smaller hmm. in data uh, storage size than hard drives. So if you've got a lot of stuff that you access intermittently, legacy hard drive is way to, you know, way to go. But regardless, even with that sort of robustness, th this is this is pushing an SSD. This is OK. I hate doing car analogies. I've been doing a car analogy. Your tires sure. will last. Uh, a normal amount of time. You, you've got a standard amount of time for, for the, the tread on your tires to last. Uh, if you don't do as much, it'll last longer. If you do more, it won't last as much. This is what Spotify did was take your tires and drive them around a racetrack at full speed in a circle over and over again for no good reason. So yeah, your tires are gonna wear out way faster And now, and I hate I hate when I get forced to make a car analogy about technology because they're always stupid. They're always stupid. Every you, you you did better than I, I I wouldn't have come up with the racetrack one. I would say it's like you're taking your tires and Spotify is just running a cheese grater over your treads for no reason. It's 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 one of those things. I mean, it's like any tech. I, I've noticed this if you've ever been in the comment section on a tech site. Um, there, there's got to be a correlation to the. There's language. the obligatory car analogy. Eventually, someone will make a car analogy in the con in the, in the comment section. Yeah, it's no, never, it's, it never fails. It's, it's. I think I think there's a a law of the internet about it. Yeah, on yeah. on the not quite on the same level as Godwin's law, but it's there. Yeah, there's some sort of corollary about this because it's fucking weird. Anyway. Now that's that's taken care of uh, the news. Oh, the news! I hate the news this week. It's been killing me. But we also have questions we get answer for you. If you have tech questions you'd like me and Mike to try and help you with, uh, you can send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. We will attempt to try and help you out with these things. Let's start with Samantha's question, which is, "Wow, wow!" There's a literal blog post she wrote. There's, about yeah, this is yeah, this is the long one. Um, I'm going to try and uh, summarize this for everybody. Um, she has a Windows 7 Dell Inspiron N5110. Uh, it's about s almost five years old now. Uh, it's got it in June 2012. Um, she's had issues with it repeatedly where they've had to wipe and replace. Um, she didn't do Windows 10. Um, and now she's at the point where she boots it up and it goes to a black screen when she tries to start Windows. Uh, it just sits there with nothing happening, no cursor, just black. Um, she's tried to use the startup repair option, but there are no restore points. Now let's get let's get to her questions here. Um, she, three questions she has. If it's a hardware issue, I know I'm likely better off buying a new machine. If so, what would you recommend? If it's a software issue, is there a way to fix it? And you think there's a chance of being wiped for the sixth time? And three, I can't get the computer to start up normally in order to back up the files I need onto a USB. Is there a way for me to back up the hard drive 
and the machine's current state to attempt to salvage my data. Um, the, fir the third one we can answer first. Yes, there okay. is. So, well, even in safe mode, you should be able to USB backup stuff. Can she get in no. safe, she can get safe no. mode? She, okay. I, I read over all this. She can't get the safe mode. It just goes to that black screen. It doesn't do anything more. She can ah. get to the system restore, but she can't do safe mode. So she can do okay. startup repair. Uh, yes, if you can get if you can get the drive to another machine, you can absolutely yeah. get the data off. There. All right. Assuming assuming the drive itself is just not completely toast. Well, well it doesn't sound like because she can get to the startup repair, which means she can access the drive. It's just Windows is the problem here. So, if that's the case, yes, you can do this, Samantha. Um, what you're going to need to do, and it's not going to be a whole lot of work for you, fortunately, but it is going to be a little bit of work. You're going to have to look up a teardown or uh, an iFixit or something like that for your model of your laptop here. Um, it's, it's Inspiron 50. I believe that's we're talking laptop here. Yeah, well, I just Googled it and it said, yeah, that's a laptop. Yeah. All right. What you're going to do is you're going to look up and see how to remove the hard drive from the laptop. Now, the good news here is... It is incredibly, uh, re re uh, relative to all the other things you could do to fix a laptop, removing and replacing a hard drive is so easy. It's, 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 you'll need a Phillips head screwdriver, and that's probably about it. Um, once you remove the drive, we've talked about this in previous episodes, um, there is, you'll need a USB to uh, SATA, I believe, yeah, it's a SATA, 2012, it's a SATA adapter. Uh, you'll need a USB to SATA adapter, S-A-T-A. -A. Uh, let me see if I can find an example of this for you. What this will do is pretty much allow you to turn the hard drive itself into a USB stick temporarily. Now, you are going to need another computer to be able to copy the data over, but with this little adapter, you'll be able to turn your drive into a portable drive long enough for you to find all your the stuff you need on there and copy it off. Um, now I've looked up the I've looked up the fix it by the way and there's uh -huh. a fix it. Now how, it basically it's a fix it for hard drive replacement. Right. But same sort of deal. Um and it is pretty it's it's well it's not complex uh by the time you get to the hard drive and it is a SATA drive. That was the important thing I was looking up in this was to make sure it was a SATA interface and not some something screwy and proprietary. And this is not an expensive thing either. Let me uh, let me show you here. Um, this is from Newegg. It's not an expensive device. It's it's relatively cheap device. Yeah, fifteen twenty dollars. Yeah, this this one I'm looking at right now on on Newegg is twelve. It's on sale. It's twelve bucks. Um, and and quite honestly. My opinion, everyone should have one of these. Yeah, let, let just you're gonna need it sooner or later. It's just it plugs into the back of it, and because it's a it's a two point five inch um, notebook hard drive, you shouldn't require any additional power either. The USB should be able to power it because laptop hard drives don't require power connectors; they just have the one. So you should be all set with this. You plug this in, you'll be able to read your old hard drive just like it were a USB stick, and you'll be able to copy your stuff off. You will need another computer to do this. I think you say you have a backup one. So you're okay there, and it won't screw anything up if you just copy things. Don't delete anything. Just copy it. You shouldn't screw anything up. Uh, let's, yeah, we'll go backwards here. Is it a software issue? Hard to say. Even given the information you've given us, you put a blog post up that had a lot of stuff hard to say if it's a hardware or a software issue here um yeah. especially when we're talking about a laptop that old and i know four three four four five years does not seem like an old laptop it really is um they're not built i i, I it's rare to see a laptop that's built very well for endurance and longevity they're designed to be kept about three years and then replaced yeah to give you an idea, that is three to four years is about the cycle time mm -hmm. the, the branch of the government I work for has on their laptops. And this last time around, we all went to laptops unless you specifically requested a desktop. Yeah. So and and for ours, at three three years, we start seeing a lot of failures. Now some of that's because people I work with 
just bounce their shit around. They they treat it like Grady would. Now, as to what we could recommend for a replacement on this, um, uh, what did you say? What did she say? Her needs were here. Her needs were has Microsoft uh, Office Word and Steam compatible with a. Herion H16, I believe that's, is that a, it's a, it's a tablet, a drawing tablet, and Steam. Um, hmm. Well, the drawing tablet shouldn't be an issue, and no, that should, that should be easy. just, that should be anything. Um, uh, what you might want to check when you're, because right now you're going to be hard pressed to find a laptop that still has Windows 7 on it. Microsoft has basically stopped OEM sales. Um, and you're going to be Windows 10. So check to make sure your lap, your your graphics tablet there has Windows 10 drivers. It should. Otherwise, obviously. it should. But you know, check as well. Um, the uh, so it, pretty much any laptop. Yeah, will it's do. got Windows 10 support. It's got Windows okay. 10 support. Perfect. Then so uh, pretty much any laptop will do for what you need. Uh, I would, you know, look at what your look at what your budget is, look uh, and. I'd go a little bit lower because you might end up having to need an extra accessory or two just to make it as functional or mm. have the same level of functionality that you wanted with your old one. Because sometimes laptops ship now with less USB ports than you're used to because mm. they go, oh, everyone's going to have a docking station or something like that yep. now. Or uh, you may want to get a travel power adapter or something, just whatever. So I would say take your budget, subtract $100 for extra accessories that you might want to yeah, you know, obviously, unless your budget is a hundred dollars, in which case, wow, you're gonna not get much in the way of a laptop. Um, as but, far yeah. as the laptop itself, uh, I, I would, I would go to Newegg or someone like that and see what they have on on deals for brands. Uh, I like Asus, ASUS; those are good. Uh, MSI, uh, they they make good laptops too. One um, thing to watch out with MSI, and this is not a detraction; it's mm -hmm. they've got basically two lines of laptops. One is their sort of general purpose laptops, and one is their gaming set of laptops. Yeah. And if, you're, if your budget is, is a little tight, do not get sucked into their gaming line. They're fantastic. They're wonderful. They're pretty. They're powerful. And they cost a lot. Now, Brad just did this, and uh, I, I, I saw it, and I was like, oh, he, didn't, he had no idea about this stuff. Um, make sure whatever laptop you get has an i5 Intel processor bare yes. minimum you if you can splurge and go for an i7 that's good you also want to look to see if it has uh, an nvidia graphics card in the laptop that's a bonus not a necessity but it's a bonus but your bare yes. minimum requirement for whatever you get has an i5 processor because i went we shot we were shooting jesus bro yesterday and Brad says, yeah, uh, I got this new laptop. Uh, it's a little bit slow and laggy. Can you take a look at it? And he hands it, was it to I3, me. It was an i3, wasn't it? It was a Celeron. Okay, Nash, I, I need you to pass something along to Brad for me. Sure. I don't know Brad well. Sure. I want you to walk up behind him, smack him on the back of the head like Gibbs would out of the CIS. Celeron is... Unless he's far bigger than you. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who don't know out there, Celeron is the uber budget model for Intel's processors. They 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 can't do crap. It's the Intel potato. Yeah, it's the Intel potato. You want to make sure your bare minimum is an Intel Core i5 processor. Whatever you get from whatever company. And we don't get money from Intel. No. We're saying you don't want a potato. Yeah, and, and an AMD for, I, I couldn't in, in good conscience recommend it, not with, with the way they're being right now. No. So you, you want to, what is a Celeron? A Celeron is, is it's slower. Celeron is a, is a term they made up to make it sound fast so they could sell you substandard stuff. Accelerate, Celeron, yay. No, it's crap. Celeron it, it, is crap. It is It is their budget line. When it first came out, and you were on a budget, it was okay because it was the new line, budget line. But now? Something just exploded. Where's Yay! Grady? Where's Grady? I don't know. What, what's now? He didn't give a shit. Okay, no, I'm just making sure it wasn't him. Yeah, he's right here. Anyway. On the roof with a sniper rifle shooting at cars again. 
Yeah. Um, so NSA, if you're listening, Brady's a cat. He's a cat. He's a cat. So in, in general, yeah, that you should be okay. You should be able to get the data off your old drive. If you re, but yeah, it is time to get a new laptop. I don't say that to make you spend money. I'd say that because that's how they're designed. They are yeah. planned to be get a new one, get rid of the old one. We don't give a shit if it costs you a thousand dollars every three years. You need to get a new fucking laptop because now, we need to stay in business. Yeah. Now, what I would look at as well, in addition to what Nash has said, is uh, expandability on the laptop. A lot of laptops these days come with one hard drive built in and room for you to add one or more additional drives, usually in the form of SSDs. Mm. Not always, but some, yeah, often. Um, and you'll need to make sure when you're buying it what format the SSDs are, because there's a lot of different connection formats. So if you decide to upgrade, you get the right one. Uh, again, I would say look at Newegg when you're, even if you don't buy there, the reviews are useful to look at and and to go this is a, a a four or five you know star actually they use eggs five egg machine yeah it's got very few negatives any of the negative is usually a guy who goes it showed up it was broken it showed up you know when it showed up and they gave me a little bit of a hassle and he never upgraded his his review when they fixed his hassle uh okay well we got we got to move on because we we, have, sure. we got questions to cover um the next one is about microphones. Let's do the microphone question. This is definitely much more in your wheelhouse. Um, this comes from uh, Gumsy. Gumsy has this question about microphones. He writes, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, cardioid microphones that use XLR to 3.5 millimeter connection. Notice a lot of those run cheap. They also have to come with a shock mount. At the moment, I have a blue snowball for recording in my room, and it served me well. However, I need to get a shock mount as it shakes every time I hit record. I also have a machine in my living room that I want to plug a microphone into for streaming. I'm weary of the price of these microphones uh, compared to something like the snowball. My question is, uh, um, should I look into picking up one of the microphones? Should I invest in a shock mount for the snowball, or is there a better way? Am I also curious about which connection uh, would have the better audio quality? Okay, so, well, my first thought is if you like the Snowball and it's working for you, I would get the shock mount for the Snowball. I mean, a shock mount, correct me if I'm wrong here, Nash, we're talking the, the sort of open right. cage with the rubber, not quite rubber band, but elasticized pieces in there to keep it. Yeah, uh, what a shock mount is. Uh, they it, run about $30. I, it's cheaper than a microphone. Well, no, not in this case. Here, let, let me, let me, let me, let's break this down. I'll show you guys what's going on here. Um, these okay. are some of the microphones he's looking at. They're off brand. I don't know the brand name of them. Um, they run in the twenty to thirty dollar range for the microphone and shock mount. I can already tell you, don't waste your money on these. These are. Uh, I don't trust the star ratings here either because the people who get these really don't understand the nuance of recording this stuff. These are super cheap. You are getting what you pay for here. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of these look very pretty in the pictures, but honestly, you're not buying a microphone for looks most of the time. Yeah, a lot of these are cheap uh, Chinese-made microphones. They're cranked out. Uh, I'm not knocking Chinese goods because there's a lot of... Just about every fucking thing we got made in China, and a lot of that stuff is very good. I got a Chinese-made uh, uh, Fender guitar for my girlfriend. It's an excellent guitar. But in this case, at this price for $30, um, no, no. I would not trust this any farther than I can throw it. I do know the Snowball. It's a known quantity. It's a good microphone, and Blue does make shock mounts for the Snowball. I would go with the shock mount for the blue because you already we are, the snow the blue snowball. It's not the best microphone, but for the money, it is. It's not the best microphone all the overall, but in its price range, it is definitely the best. It, it's sort of like I don't know how to describe this. I gotta go to a car analogy, Nash. God it's damn it! It's the Volvo of microphones. Yeah, it's it's not it's not flashy. It's not spectacular. It'll get you there. Yeah, it's it doesn't have all, the blue snowball doesn't have a whole lot of features. It's pretty much just plug it into a USB port and you're done. Now you uh, you ask also about XLR to three point five millimeter. I'm not done anything with that type of conversion. 
everything I have is XLR comes in and then eventually converts to USB. Yeah. But actually I, FireWire in my case. But I, I wouldn't go with the XLR to 3.5 millimeter. Now, ideally, what you want to do is invest uh, somewhere between $100 and $200 in a setup that includes um, a mixer and a good $100, $150 microphone. Though, and that, those, I, I want to stress that two hundred dollars. That's still a baseline investment. You're eventually you'll want to replace that microphone later. But if you have a good uh, mixer board with XLR inputs, you can plug into your computer. It gives you a base to build off of. But in your case, and specifically what we're talking about right here, without getting you to spend a gajillion dollars on investing on a whole new setup. Just get the shock mount for the Blue Snowball. It might cost as much as this microphone over here, but I guarantee you your Blue Snowball will serve you better than this microphone will. That, that's just from my own experience, my own use of them, trial and error. Get a shock mount. It's a better overall investment. Um, also, another little way to do this is, and we did this with Tara's microphone. We set her up. Isolate the microphone from your recording surface. Um, you wanna get, and again, it's not very much. I've seen these go for as cheap as $10. A boom swing arm. Just put it right, uh, something you could you could attach the microphone to that is not connected to your, your table where you're typing or all the other stuff. Uh, just a simple boom swing arm. You put it next to your, that's what I have my microphone on right now. And because it's not in contact with the desk, it doesn't pick up the vibrations of the desk. It isolates it, and you're fine. The $10 boom arms can't handle weight. I've got a $10 boom arm right now. It's fine. Yeah. It's good. And my, my microphone is very heavy. You'll be good. Trust You go to Guitar Center and get one for $15. bucks. you will be yep. okay. Um... Let's see, we've got some more time. What are we going to look at next? Oh, okay. This is one from Daryl. Um, I'm looking to do more live streaming of newer games, and I'm wondering which is more effective, streaming locally from my computer or using a second computer uh, with a video capture card. Uh, I already have two computers. The only difference is one is one that has an HD60 Pro capture card, and the other has a Radeon uh, R9 384 gigabyte card. Am I putting more resource strain on my gaming computer by having it send the video to two sources than I am if I'm just streaming directly from the computer? Well, uh, That's a very good question that I absolutely don't know the answer. Okay, to. I know my old video card before I got the, the current one, would heat up like you wouldn't believe if I split the video to my monitor and my TV. Mm. So I have to think it's something like that. Well, uh, here's, all right, let's break down how game streaming works. There are two ways to stream video games online. The first way is with game capture. And that's not video, that's not the capture card. That is on the machine that's doing the streaming. Like, I, and this is something I do because I don't have two computers set up. You uh, start the game. You start OBS, which pretty much everybody uses. Um, you start OBS, and then you use a capture window to capture either an entire monitor or just a section of your screen, and you broadcast part of the screen, which is like what I'm doing right now. You can see the screen over there. That, that, that's my desktop, and you see Mike down there. That's being captured, too. Um, and this gets translated to the streaming software and it goes out over the internet. The downside of this is this is more processor intensive and there's also some conversion going on that can cause graphic artifacts. And when there's a lot of motion, things don't look as good. Um, it works. And yes, it is intensive on the machine because you're gaming and streaming on the same machine at the same time. It is kind of intensive. It's not the ideal. In fact, I've actually been considering getting a second computer just to do the streaming and do everything else on one system. 
Um, it's certainly something you wouldn't want to try to do on a Celeron. No, not on a Celeron. Fuck that. Now, the other option people have, that's what I was just talking about, is you set up a second computer. The second computer is what does the streaming and sends the data out over the internet. And in that computer, you have a capture card. You take the video output from your first computer, you run it to that capture card in the second computer. That way, all the gaming is be and, and processing work is being done on one system, and the streaming work is being done on the second. It doesn't have to extrapolate a desktop image or capture the game. It just has to receive it like it would uh, as if it were a monitor, as if it yeah. were, you were plugging in an HDMI cord into a monitor. Okay. Um, that is less intensive on both systems, um, and I it's it does look it looks better. Uh, I if you have if you're in the position to be able to afford to do this and can do it, I'd recommend doing it. But let's put a little asterisk on that. Um, in doing so, you have to understand you're going to have to come up with some solutions out of the box. Um, for one thing, your street, your cut, you also have to capture the audio to the other streaming device, and that includes your microphone audio. Um, you also have to be able to control both computers at the same time to be able to have a look at, is my stream running okay? And look at your game at the same time. Um, a lot of people use what's uh, a keyboard and mouse splitter that uh, it's a USB device that allows you to send the keyboard and mouse output from one keyboard and one mouse to two different computers. Or, yeah. yeah? I'll say, yeah, KVM device. Yeah, KVM device. That, that's what it's called. Because he knows, because I'm pretty sure you have to use those at work quite a bit. Not not so much anymore, but I have used them in the past. Yeah. Um, Especially on the workbench. We use that a lot on the workbench. We'd set up a, yeah. a station, well, what... a repair station. What's what can be fun is KVM over Ethernet. Uh, another solution to this, however, is also a uh, remote desktop. Uh, yeah. Not across the internet, but across your home own home network, which works fairly effectively. Doesn't put too much strain on the system, and you can you you might not even need another monitor for that other computer you have set up if you just remote desktop into that. You give it its own monitor, and you can control the stream. You tab over to it, and you just do your settings and tab back. And... Um, at the end of the day. You'll have to look into how to set it up to fit your needs, but when it comes to... Yeah. Hmm? I say, since you have the two computers already, and you have the video card, and you have the capture card, it's you've probably got a good setup there, yeah. from what Nash has said, to to go that route. Two computers, and it's not a huge... As long as as long as the video card is not a potato itself, and you're getting... You know, yeah. I would put... Uh, you know, If you have SpeedFan as the, the software, I would download that just to keep an eye on the... If you don't have it, I would use it to keep an eye on the video card's temperature. Because, you know, it's just, a, it's more work yeah. on the video card. But if video card's up to it, it's not going to be too bad. And it's not a tremendous amount of work. It's 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 exact same amount of work as outputting to another monitor. Yeah. Which yeah, is... My, my old video card heated up because it was a potato. Right. So many, well, stop plugging potatoes into your electronics, Mike. There's your problem. Knock it off with potatoes. Um, but in this case, it's, uh, it, it's a matter of, uh, it, it doesn't put any more strain on a video card than it would if you had it added another monitor to your setup. That's what you're doing. You're taking the output from the video card and sending it to another computer like that other computer was a monitor. Most video, modern video cards, especially the one you mentioned, the, uh, the R9 380, that can handle multiple monitors, no sweat. It's just the other little fidgety things like figuring the audio output and setting up the second system and all that and getting it all arranged. That's your only hurdle in terms of is it feasible? It's, it's not only feasible, it's what I would recommend if you're serious about game streaming. It's your better option than doing And I do the capture. And like I said, I'm thinking about mm, I want to move to something else because this is yeah not ideal. Um, the good thing about the game capture stuff is they do take in the audio output and all those other things. So, yeah. yeah. So, that's what I would recommend. Um, let's see here. I think that's, that's, that's about all the time we have tonight. So, yeah, we're coming up on the hour okay. mark. 
Um, folks, thank you for tuning in once again. As, as always, if you have tech questions for Mike and myself, send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. We'll attempt to assist you with them. And geez, oh, good night and good luck. Yeah. <laughs>